Uh, so hello, welcome everyone uh, to our uh, uh, fifth lecture already uh, on uh, of the Hakith Vienna International Science School. It's my very great pleasure uh, to welcome today our second speaker from Hakif, uh, a legendary uh, mathematician, Vadim Kaloshin. Uh, uh, so Vadim is a professor at the Institute of Science uh, and Technology, uh, Austria. Uh, he is um, uh, an expert on uh, dynamical systems, and he's going to talk to us today about Markov partitions and coding the cap map. And uh, I may, may already warn you, uh, Vadim, our students are very keen. And uh, from some of the previous lectures, they have questions they'd like to uh, ask you. So welcome, Vadim, and it's a, a real pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, Michael, for organizing all of this. This is a remarkable idea, and uh, I'm really happy uh, to give these lectures. Um, so um, uh, the topic of my lectures will be something which uh, uh, seems counterintuitive. Uh, when people study evolution of various systems, they very often come with a uh, map. I mean, sometimes it could be a map of a circle into itself. Sometimes it could be a, a, a multidimensional maps, and sometimes they are linear, sometimes they are nonlinear. But it turns out the idea of coding orbits of a map, even though nonlinear, uh, turns out to be very fruitful. And uh, on one side, you could write some very complicated formula. On the other side, um, you could just uh, write a code for your map. So uh, my plan today is I will look at a very simple system of a, a so-called expanding map of a circle. Uh, I will show you how to code orbits of this map. And after that, I will show you a map which was proposed by uh, a prominent mathematician of uh, 20th century, Vladimir Arnold, which is called the CAT map. And it turns out that uh, that map can be coded too. So coded the map means I could code the orbits. And uh, in order to code orbits of a second map, we will need uh, something which is called Markov partitions. So lecture will be of two parts. One is a warm up when we will discuss maps of a circle into itself. And then we will go to the cat map. So let me start with the maps of a circle. So map of a circle, uh, expanding map of a circle can be written in several different ways. So let me start with the first one. Uh, I look at the uh, uh, unit circle, and you could think of it as a unit circle on the complex plane. And I consider a map z goes to z square uh, when I restrict to the unit circle. Uh, so one way to think about this map is I take a circle and wrap around twice. If you write this map as a e to the 2 pi i phi, then the map consists in uh, angle phi between 0 and 1 goes to 2 phi modulo 1. Is the definition clear? So how does it work? I mean, students are reacting somehow or how do we get the feedback? Is the definition of them? Michael, you're muted. Uh, yeah, don't worry about uh, the students. They, uh, <laughs> they will complain if they have questions. Okay, so we will, for the next 10 or 15 minutes, we are going to study and map phi goes to 2 phi mod 1, and phi is going to be changing between 0 and 1. And the first question which we would like to answer, we would like to analyze uh, 
all the periodic orbits of this map. And uh, the simplest periodic orbit of this map is zero. When you send zero, you double zero, you get back zero. And we will look not only at uh, uh, finding those periodic orbits, I would like to code them. So um, here's the first warm up lemma. So the first warm up lemma says that uh, 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 the number of periodic points, um, the number of periodic points is um, two to the k minus one. So it turns out for is it for each. So let's see. So it's a question. Okay, um, so um, in order to calculate periodic orbits of this map, uh, let's just write down the formula. And uh, uh, the formula of the case iterate of this map is quite simple because each time we double our map and we take mod one. So as a result, if we iterate our map k times, then after k iterates, we multiply our uh, variable x, uh, I jump from phi to x, I hope it's okay. Uh, we multiply it by 2k and we are trying to find all those x for which 2k x uh, is uh, equal to x modulo one. So this is a simple exercise to see that there will be exactly two to the k minus one solutions of this system. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, you could write them explicitly. Um, so it turns out that uh, if you want to look at the number of periodic points of the of a map of this type, the exact formula is not quite important. Uh, if we only assume that our map is expanding and wrap around the circle exactly twice, then it turns out that the same, lemma, the same lemma holds true. So one of the messages which I want to give in this lecture is that sometimes in people in dynamical system, they discover a principle and then they see that this principle works for a classes of maps. So let's see, there is a question. Could you please explain what... Uh, uh, I'm not sure what does it mean, periodic map. I'm looking for periodic points. Uh, the, uh, does it answer the question? I'm, lo I'm looking for solutions uh, uh, of this equation. Okay. Um, so um, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to code these periodic points. And uh, uh, and the idea of coding will come back. Let's see, so it's a question. Uh, mod one, exactly. Fkx mod x is mod one. Okay, so uh, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to code my orbits. And it turns out that the most naive coding which you could imagine works. So it turns out that if I want to code my orbits, periodic orbits, then uh, what I need to do, I need to use sequences of zero and one. For example, there is a periodic orbit which has a code which consists of only zeros. Uh, there is a periodic orbit for which there is a code zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and so on. So it turns out that for any code, uh, which is a sequence of zero and one, there is a periodic orbit which corresponds to this code. So there is only one exception in this uh, story is periodic orbit, which consists of all zeros is zero, but uh, the periodic orbit, which consists of all ones is one and zero is one modulo one. So is the statement of the lemma clear? Mm -hmm. So every periodic orbit of period K for expanding map of the circle 
can be coded by a sequence of zeros and ones. And every code has one single periodic orbit with an exception that all zeros is equal to all ones. Any questions? This is clear? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, now there is a uh, way of saying zero one, and there is a geometric way of uh, doing the coding. And let me show you the geometric way. The geometric way of doing the coding is the following. Let me chop the circle into two halves. So there will be a black half, which is between zero and one half. And there will be a red half, which is between, uh, oops. Uh, uh, and there will be a, uh, a, a red half, which is between one half uh, and one. And then the way I'm going to code the orbits is the following. I will iterate my map. And if uh, at the beginning I was in the black interval, I say zero. If I was at the red interval, I say one. Then I take two X mod one, and then I again look whether I'm in a black interval or in the red interval. As a result, as you keep iterating, each time you will be watching whether you are in the black interval or in the red interval. And after K iterates, you will get your code. You will get the sequence black, red, black, red, black, red, or zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. As a result, if I'm telling you that uh, there is a periodic orbit, then after k iterates it of period k, then after k iterates it will come back to itself. And I will not be hitting one half because if I hit one half, it's not a periodic orbit. Let's see. Is coding an arbitrary map or it does? So uh, I'm not proving it, but every expanding map of the circle of degree two has the same coding. Does this answer the question? Expanding means F prime, F prime of X is bigger than one. Okay. So I'm telling you it's for X goes to two X mod one, but the same principle works for any nonlinear map. And the only thing you need you need F prime as bigger than one. Are there any other questions? So we did prove that every orbit has a code, but we need to prove much more. So what do we need to prove? Theoretically, it may happen that we give codes, but different periodic orbits have the same code, right? A good code is that every periodic orbit has a code and every code has a periodic orbit. So what we did not prove is that every code uh, has only one periodic orbit. And uh, this is actually not very difficult to observe in uh, uh, linear situation and it can be extended to a nonlinear situation. So if we have two periodic orbits of period K, which have the same code, then you could actually observe that it's not possible with uh, our procedure, because if X and Y are different, then every time you iterate them, the distance between them doubles. But we also know that they have the same code. It means as we iterate, they always land inside of the same interval. So if 
they land inside of the same interval, it means the distance between them is, a, as you iterate, it is less than a half on one side. Uh, and uh, uh, if it's less than a half, uh, then it cannot grow by more than a one. And this actually leads to a contradiction. So because the map is expanding and because the codes of two orbits is the same, they should always land inside of the same interval. And as a result, in one iterate, they cannot jump by distance more than one. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. So we proved something which for expansion map, x goes for two x mod one is uh, quite natural that every periodic orbit of this map can be coded by sequence zero and one. And once I told you that there is this coding, you could actually ask where other questions about this map without doing a calculation. So when people study dynamical systems or when study maps, they look, for example, at the number of periodic orbits of period K. And what is interesting is to see, for example, whether the number of periodic orbits grows to infinity as the period goes to infinity. And it is also interesting to see how quickly it goes to infinity. And about 60 years ago or 50 years ago, people were investigating so-called dynamical zeta function. So what is a dynamical zeta function? Dynamical zeta function is when you uh, uh, take the number of periodic orbits, and as you take the number of periodic orbits, you form a formal power series. Namely, you say z to the k times pk of f. And it turns out that there are wide classes of dynamical systems for which dynamical zeta function turned out to be a rational function. So let me, is the definition of the number of periodic points clear? Is it? So is the definition of dynamical zeta function is clear? We are seeing proofs in the chat already, uh, but I think we are good. Okay, zeta is a geometric series. Yes, it is, uh, it is almost a geometric series, but the statement is that actually the same is true is that map is, if, if map is not linear. Yes, it, it must be rational. So it's a much more general statement than what I say. The only thing I need, I need it to be expanding and I need it to be of degree more than one. So I leave here, um, maybe make a screenshot. Uh, so I give you a, a bunch of exercises. So in the case when you have a linear expanding map, x goes to 2x or x goes to 3x mod 1, uh, this is a very simple exercise of calculate the number of periodic points and compute the dynamical zeta function. But the thing which I want to emphasize is that it's, uh, it's not a miracle that dynamical zeta function is rational. So it turns out that it's rational for white classes of maps. And uh, when I will start talking about cat map, um, I will explain you a principle which allows you not only to code the orbits, but it also allows you uh, um, uh, to prove that dynamical zeta function is rational. Uh, for example, when you are coding the orbit, you could probably see that the number of periodic points grows exponentially with the period. And as it grows exponentially with the period, there is a chance 
the dynamical zeta function is rational. Are there any questions? Okay. Now we move on to dimension two. So what does it mean dimension two? Um, I was talking about a map of a circle into itself. And I suggest that you exercise your imagination because now I'm going to be talking about a map of two dimensional torus into itself. And uh, the picture which you see on the screen has an analytic formula. Uh, namely, I take X and Y, which are both between zero and one. So I am starting with a square. And then I am applying a map which is linear in its variables. Namely, the first component of my map is going to be 2X plus Y mod one. And the second component of my map is going to be X plus Y mod one. Uh, what you could see on the picture is that if I take a horizontal segment between zero and one, it means that Y is identically equal to zero, then the vector between zero to one, the red vector, which I have just drawn, will be mapped into a vector to one under this map. So I hope it's clear. So the, uh, I already drew it. Uh, let me do it again. So the image of a horizontal vector uh, becomes a vector to one. Okay. If I take a vertical vector, which is black, and also map it with me this map, then it will map into the diagonal, namely the vertical vector zero one is mapped into a vector which has 45 degrees angle. Right, because if, uh, if X is zero, then uh, I map in zero Y into Y Y. So the way to visualize this map is um, you kind of stretch it is kind of in the uh, diagonal direction and you contract it in uh, uh, perpendicular to diagonal direction. And if you want to see back your map of a two-dimensional torus into itself, you could chop uh, the parallelogram, which I uh, described, uh, into four parts. I intentionally numbered them from one to four. And if you chop it into, it into four parts, you could assemble those four parts back into, uh, uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the torus. Is the map clear? Is it? Yeah. Okay, so it turns out that this map can be coded. And uh, and the principle to code this map actually works not only in the case of uh, linear maps. So um, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to do uh, a certain procedure. And the procedure will be somewhat similar to the previous procedure. I will cut my torus into parts. And by cutting my torus into parts, I will try to code the orbits. And naturally, as we are in dimension more than one, coding the orbits 
becomes a more delicate task, but we will succeed. So I will not only code the orbits, uh, I will uh, show you a way of calculating the number of periodic points. And as you saw for the expanding maps of a circle, in order to calculate the number of periodic points, you need to calculate the number of codes. And in the case of a expanding map, the number of codes was naturally equal to two to the K and minus one because of identification. So what we are going to do now, we are going to uh, uh, start cutting our torus. So to the question, is it possible to calculate the number of periodic points? The answer will be yes. And to the question whether we could code, the answer will also be yes, but the situation will be a little bit more difficult. Uh, so first, uh, the way I will be coding, I will be cutting my torus into parts. And uh, what you will see is that when I will be cutting my torus into parts, the first attempt will be not successful. I will cut it only in two parts, but actually I will rectify my attempt. And eventually you will see that for the cat map, I need to cut my torus into five parts. So my goal is to show you how I will cut uh, my torus into parts. And then the statement will be very similar to the statement which you saw before. Uh, for every code, there is a periodic orbit. And every periodic orbit, there is a code. The distinction is here. It turns out that not all codes are possible. And I will try to explain you what does it mean admissible code. In a sense, admissible code is something which you see in the language. For example, uh, it's very rare that after a letter A, you have again a letter A, but it is impossible to have uh, A, 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 unless it's uh, some commercial uh, name. So uh, admissible codes, it means that after a certain symbol, you may or may not have another symbol. Like uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Latin, it's very rare that you will have ZZ or, uh, or you'll have uh, BBB uh, three times. So admissible, which means that after a certain symbol, you may have uh, only a, a limited se a selection of other symbols. So let me now start telling you how I will construct a partition. And, uh, uh, and uh, my goal is, first of all, to chop into good pieces. And uh, second of all, to show how to construct those pieces. Is the uh, idea of coding clear? Is it? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so do you see? Uh, okay, you don't see. So there is a condition which must be satisfied, and this condition is something which uh limits any partition that you want certainly uh, i could have just said give me a torus i will cut it in two halves and uh end of the story so uh, the consistency condition which we need to satisfy has the following nature so is there a question can be sure okay um so um, uh, the consistency uh, 
condition is the following. Imagine that I started with uh, 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 at some rectangle pi i, and after a number of iterates, I went to a rectangle pi j. Mm -hmm. It means that there should be a code which says that I start with a symbol i and go to a symbol j. But then you could ask yourself, wonderful, uh, uh, let me go to from a symbol j to a symbol k. So the situation is going to be consistent if I could start with a symbol i and to go to symbol k at the time, which is a sum of the times. So this is a consistency condition which must be satisfied. If the code says that from i, I could go to j in m steps, and then if I could go from j to k in m steps, then I should be able to go from i to k in m plus n steps. Is this clear? Because the codes, they, they are just saying, they are telling you whether you could go from I to J, and then they are telling you whether you could go from J to K. They are not telling you where, in which part of a rectangle you are and which additional properties. So in the example which I showed you of expanding maps, situation is very simple because if you take half of the circle, after one iterates, you have this whole circle. So the situation was automatically satisfied for expanding circle maps because it's just in one iterate, you were covering everything. So is the consistency condition clear? Any questions? No, okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Maybe one question. Is there a typo in the last line? Sorry? Is there a typo in the last line? Should it be F3 of I1? F3 of Y1? Well, it's actually F2. Um, I'm uh, applied to I1. I'm sorry. No? Yeah. It's just, I mean, uh, uh, it's a little sloppy to say from one half to three halves. Mm -hmm. But uh, I take interval from one half to one, and then they take a, 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 a Dublin map. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think it yeah. should be one and two. And when I take mod one, then uh, I get my, I get a circle. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, so now someone will give us a knife and we will start cutting the torus. But we need to be careful in the way we cut the torus because consistency condition, in order to satisfy consistency condition, you need to be smart. And let's try to be smart with the consistency condition. Mm -hmm. So um, it turns out that when you look at your map 2111, then uh, your map 2111, uh, you probably already saw it in the picture. Uh, this map. Uh, expands kind of in the diagonal direction. And let me try to make this uh, statement more formal. So when you take matrix two, one, uh, one, one, um, then um, uh, there is a direction which expands. And this is a red direction which I'm describing to you. So it turns out that if I take a direction which has a very precise slope, and you see the slope at the 
top uh, right angle, then this direction gets stretched. What it means, it means that if I take uh, this, uh, uh, if I take the origin, if I, and I take points on this line with a, with a, with a slope, which I described to you, then if I apply my cat map, I will be on exactly the same line. It will be, I will be just uh, square three plus square root of five divided by two further away. So what happens is along the red direction, I keep stretching. And similarly, along the black direction, I will be contracting. I hope it's natural that if you are stretching in one direction, you should be contracting in the other because we take a torus and when we plow in our map, we get back the torus, which means that the area should stay the same. So what you see in the picture, you see on the picture what our map does, it stretches along red directions uh, and it contracts along the black directions. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to chop my torus into two parts. There will be uh, a black, uh, there will be a, a uh, rectangle A, and there will be a rectangle B. So this will be my rectangle A. And then there will be a rectangle B. And the way that these rectangles are constructed, I just look at the intersection of uh, the associated directions. And everything starts uh, at the origin. So here's uh, the origin. Here's a translated copy of the origin and another translated copy of the origin. So from the origin, I emanate red line and the black line, and I see how they self-intersect each other. So is this, with this explanation clear how two rectangles came around? Uh, okay, so it's clear. So um, now what I want to do, I want to verify consistency condition. And I'm sure that the first person who uh, checked consistency condition in the form I will show you got very excited because the consistency condition turns out to be very simple. Uh, it's just one needs to find the proper division into rectangles so that the consistency condition is uh, the consistency condition holds. So it turns out that for this particular partition into two rectangles, consistency condition does not work. So let me show you when we are happy. So it turns out that we are happy when the following picture holds through. So let me try to explain it with a little bit more details. So I have a rectangle pi i, and I want to see how rectangle pi i intersects rectangle pi j. And what you could remember from my previous discussions is uh, rectangles have red sides and they have black sides. The black sides are going to shrink and the red sides are going to be expanded. So it turns out that if when I take the image of a rectangle pi i, it cuts 
rectangle pi j all the way across, then this is a good crossing. So let me emphasize what does it mean, good crossing. It means it starts on one side and goes all the way to the other side. So what is a bad crossing? The bad crossing, if it starts crossing and then gets tired and doesn't cross all the way through. So it turns out that in order to have consistency condition, whenever you stretch, you need to stretch all the way through. Namely, you need to start on one side and you, you need to go all the way to the other side. So why is that? So let's see. So uh, let me maybe uh, give it a try. So suppose pi i is mapped into pi j. And suppose pi j is mapped to pi k. So let us try to imagine how pi i will look like if we apply both maps. So my claim is that the way pi i will look is the following. Pi i is going to be something very, very thin and very, very long. But the key words, it will cut all the way through because it should be more narrow in the black direction and in the red direction. Uh, it should be more narrow in the black direction and much longer in the, uh, in the black direction. So let me maybe complete the picture and hopefully you will see what I'm saying. So. This is the image of uh, f of n plus m of interior of pi i. Why? Because I should be stretching along the red direction and I should be contracting along the black direction. And what you see in the intersection, you see the intersection is also you are cutting all the way through. So this picture is a famous picture. And uh, what is remarkable with this picture is you could iterate it as many times as you want if there is a code. Which describe which uh, which is admissible means that the corresponding rectangles uh, are actually uh, in, uh, intersecting each other all the way through. Then there is a uh, orbit which uh, 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 which uh, uh, which corresponds to this itinerary. So, um, is the consistency picture clear? Okay, so now um, let me do the following. Uh, let me show you uh, a picture of so-called Markov chain, and it will hopefully will tell you a little bit more uh, of what is the admissible codes now. So. It turns out that um, it's not enough to take, uh, let, let, me, let me tell you what I'm correcting. I'm correcting this picture. So on this picture, I told you that I will cut my torus into uh, two rectangles. One rectangle is A and another rectangle is B and uh, I will give you this as an exercise to check that actually this does not satisfy consistency condition. And the consistency condition is a picture which I 
uh, showed you just a two or three minutes ago. So this picture does not satisfy consistency condition. However, if you iterate these rectangles once and take intersections, then it will satisfy consistency condition. So you need to start with this picture, iterate once and take all the intersections. And if you take all the intersections, then it turns out that there will be five rectangles. When you have five rectangles, you could properly renumerate them from one to five. And after you renumerate those rectangles from one to five, then it turns out that not from every one rectangle, you could get to another rectangle. And in order to show from which rectangle to which rectangle you can go, you draw so-called consistency matrix. And it is naturally matrix which consists of uh, five by five entries because from every one rectangle, you need to check whether you could go to five others. Why five? Because you might be able to come back. For example, this matrix says that if you started the first uh, rectangle, you could come back to the first rectangle. And this is number one, which you see over here. Then, it turns out that from the first rectangle, you could also go to a second rectangle. And this is another one over here. It turns out that from the first rectangle, you could also go to third rectangle. And it's another number one here. From the first rectangle, you cannot go to four and five. And this is why you have zero here and you could have zero here. So the code from one to four is not possible. And the code from one to five is also not possible. Is there a question? Okay, let's see. Uh, so by going from one rectangle to another, you mean apply an F? Uh, yes. Yes. So going from one rectangle to another, it means that I apply my cat map. And after I apply my cat map, I want to see uh, whether it is possible to uh, find points inside of one rectangle, which under application of my map go into another rectangle. Now, let me go to uh, a second uh, rectangle. So actually second rectangle is different than from the first rectangle. So let me try to draw it in, in red. So you see from second rectangle, you cannot go to the first one. From the second rectangle, you cannot go back to itself. And from a second rectangle, you cannot go to the third rectangle. This is the three ones. However, from a second rectangle, you could go to fifth rectangle and you could go to the fourth rectangle. So it turns out that what you could do, you could code, uh, uh, you could code uh, all possible transitions and uh, have you seen so the matrix which we de described is called adjacency matrix. Okay, adjacency matrix means uh, from where you could go to where in one step. Have you seen taking composition of matrices? So if you have seen it, good. If you have not seen it, it's not that bad because let me tell you what does it mean A square. 
a square means I look where I could go in two steps. For example, uh, can I go from one to two in two steps? The answer is yes, I go first from one to one, and then I go from one to two. So A square, I will write down adjacency matrix by simply combining two arrows. For example, can I go from three to four in two steps? The answer is yes, I will go from three to two and from two to four. So if I will be drawing adjacency matrix, what I need to do, I just need to, uh, I just need to take uh, 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 an itinerary from three to two and from uh, two to four. So uh, by taking iterates, of this matrix, you could see whether it is possible to get from one point to uh, uh, another point by uh, taking several steps. Um, so it turns out that if you want to compute the number of periodic orbits, um, you could actually write down an explicit formula and this explicit formula can be obtained by um, taking eigenvalues of uh, the cat map matrix. So maybe I will show you it over here. Um, and, but uh, th these formulas can be derived uh, from linear algebra considerations. So let me uh, maybe show you the explicit formula and uh, uh, my time will be up. So uh, let me call this number lambda plus and let, let me call this number lambda minus. Then it turns out that the number of periodic points of period K are equal to lambda plus to the power K plus lambda minus to the power K. And I don't remember, it's either minus one or minus two. And uh, um, it, it, you, you could compute the number of periodic points by looking at the eigenvalues of the associated matrix. So the thing which is behind the scene is that actually this picture uh, uh, covers a large class of systems. Uh, in the literature, sometimes they're called of diffeomorphisms in honor of uh, uh, um, Russian mathematician Dmitry Anosov, but a more general class of systems are called hyperbolic systems. And uh, these are the maps which have always an expanding direction and the contracting direction. And those do not mix up. So if you have consistently the red directions which expand and the black directions which contract, you can construct this Markov partition, or you, in other words, you can construct coding, and the coding will be efficient in the sense that for every orbit there is a code, and for every admissible code there is an orbit. And computation of the number of codes is a problem from linear algebra, which can be successfully solved, and uh, it is possible to write down explicit formulas for the number of periodic points and prove that dynamical zeta function is rational. And maybe I will stop here. Uh, thank you, uh, Vadim, uh, for the beautiful lecture. Uh, it was really fun for me. Uh, let's see, uh, students, uh, any questions to Vadim? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, Nicholas, would you would you like to ask your question yourself? We can read it from the chat. Let's see. There is a question in the chat. Uh, yes, it is possible to crew structural stability of the cat map. Any small deformation of the cat map uh, is a cat map itself. So it can be a continuously deformed uh, into the original cat map. Yes, it is structurally stable. So what is the definition of a cat map? Um, so this is a definition. So that is the only one kit map, or is that a special example? Um, so there was a question if I deform this map, whether I'll get back a cat map, and the answer is if you deform it, then I could change coordinates so that you will get back the same formula. Oh. So it is structurally stable, meaning that uh, the formula by itself is not very important. It's, uh, I don't know, topological properties that are important uh, uh, or smooth properties. There should be expanding direction and there should be contracting direction. And there should be a Markov partition with an adjacency matrix. So if you give me a map, I will go through a procedure of cutting it into, into rectangles. And if I cut those rectangles so that the consistency condition is satisfied, then all information about cut ma uh, my, my map is uh, in the adjacency matrix. Mm -hmm. So I could write you some complicated formula, but then you cut it into rectangles, write down the adjacency matrix, and you could answer all the questions from the adjacent semantics. So in short, uh, you give me a map and I could produce admissible codes. Mm -hmm. And from those admissible codes, I could answer um, most of the questions you can have about this map. So I, I reckon also the zeta function associated with the cat map is a rational one. Exactly, exactly. Any map which expands and contracts uh, in a consistent way does have a rational dynamical zeta function. When you say contract and expand, you mean linear maps on the torus? No, or? no, no. It's just, it's just, uh, it's like for circle maps. Mm -hmm. If f prime is bigger than one, it expands. So oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So if you have a map of a circle into itself. And the derivative of this map is bigger than one. Then uh, I could change coordinates and get uh, 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 and conjugate it with a with a linear map. So let's see. There was a question. Book. Um, so there is a nice book, Brin and Stack. Uh, Green and stuck, um, and you could uh, find it. Uh, 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 let me you show you a cover of this map. Uh, is this book green? Stuck. Are you are you obliged to recommend this book, Patty? No, why? I mean, I, I this is the one I like the most. What a coincidence! So, uh. Uh, in uh, before Vadi moved uh, to Austria, he was the Brin Chair uh, of Mathematics at the University of Maryland, and Brin uh, is a, was a, is a mathematician, and he's I believe the father of one of the two founders of Google. Um, exactly. Um, so this is a um, this is a book which I would recommend if you want to study dynamical systems. And um, Michael Breen was not only 
uh, professor of mathematics and made a important contribution to a theory of dynamical systems. He was the one who proposed the first uh, search algorithm. So that was the father. The father proposed uh, the first algorithm. And then the son put it into a business. Um, yeah, I mean, the son is brilliant uh, mass problem solver too. He he won some uh, Putnam competition. I'm not sure it was Putnam, but he he was the prolific uh, Olympiad problem solver. Mm -hmm. And you know uh, who the first research director was at Google? Your colleague, Monika Hintzinger at the Institute of Science and Technology. She's a very good friend of mine. Everybody should meet. Monica. Okay. But she's a computer scientist. Yes, yes. So how, how did you get into this, uh, Vadim? Did you just enjoy cutting up Tori <laughs> as a child? <laughs> what uh, happened? <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I mean, I uh, somehow uh, uh, I like uh, uh, I mean, for me, very abstract mathematics uh, is not my cup of tea. With uh, doing dynamical systems, you could draw pictures, uh, you could uh, understand uh, some questions uh, without uh, writing uh, too long of formulas and too many definitions. So in a sense, to me, the attracting feature is that you could try to visualize uh, what you are studying uh, around you. Uh, do you have a, a problem that you can illustrate easily that is uh, that our students can relate to, but that is yet unsolved? Well, for example, uh, uh, there is a problem of uh, you let some physical system evolve in time and you are trying to understand what will be the long time behavior of your system, whether it will be chaotic uh, as time goes on or whether it will stabilize and if it stabilize uh, uh, in what form. So long time behavior of various dynamical systems is a, is a fundamental problem. You could imagine that you start with a pendulum which loses energy a little bit, uh, then uh, is, is there a good book for ergodic theory? You could start ergodic theory. Uh, you could start loading ergodic theory in here. Uh, I'll just, uh, there was a question whether is there is a good book in ergodic theory. Uh, here's chapter four. Uh, so if someone wants to study ergodic theory, first read chapters one through three, and uh, after that, uh, um, uh, uh, by the way, here's internet internet search. Uh, so here's the first algorithm, uh, or search algorithm. So anyway, long time behavior of uh, of various dynamical systems is a is a very exciting problem. Okay, is there a connection between our discussion of Kahneman's structural stability? Um, well. Uh, Yes, there is a connection, and the connection is that uh, more small systems are too simple. Uh, so there was a famous problem of which dynamical systems are stable, and uh, to the first approximation, you could say that those which are hyperbolic, they are stable. So there is a precise description of which uh, maps are stable and more smell is too simple there is a there is a more complicated systems called hyperbolic systems and those are structurally stable is there any other questions well, maybe uh, one uh, problem which I've been working on is uh, uh, <laughs> whether you could hear the shape of a drum uh, from a mathematical point of view. So it turns out that you could associate when you are playing a drum, 
you could associate a dynamical system to a drum and you could try to understand whether you could hear the shape of a drum by analyzing a dynamical system associated to it. Yeah. Well, I think you studied the problem famously successfully, uh, Vadim, not to put uh, too small uh, a point to it. Uh, but uh, but there are still open questions in relationship to in relation to that question, right? Oh yeah, I mean, for example, uh, we still don't. Uh, I mean, I guess you mean I, I, yes. I, I have a result when your drum is very close to the circular drum. Yes, uh, for drum which is close to a circular drum, we have some mathematical results. But when drum is not very close to a circular drum, then we we are still searching yes maybe some of our students will get a board um so i, I think it's a um, a good point uh to call it an evening uh for some of you uh it's a morning uh so there are uh, several students from ukraine many students from ukraine in the audience and uh, just as yesterday, uh, maybe, uh, Vadim, would you take a little time for our Ukrainian students? Oh, well, maybe I'll uh, add to the discussion uh, that uh, uh, three years ago, uh, I had the pleasure to host uh, Ilya Koval uh, from Kharkov, uh, and uh, he he's a winner and silver medalist of IMO. And when he came, he made a very important contribution to so-called Birgov conjecture. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to interact with him and maybe some of you, you know, Ilya. And I, I personally myself grew up in Kharkov. Uh, we, we have heard. So maybe um, uh, let's call it in, um, um, uh, let's end the session, uh, the general session for everyone. But uh, if Vadim and our students from Ukraine, and in particular those from Kharkiv, uh, will stay behind, and uh, um, um, you know, you can exchange some stories, I would like that. Uh, so thanks to everyone for joining, and uh, see you tomorrow with Lisa Sauermann's lecture, to which I personally also look forward to. Thank you, Michael. Very Great much. Pleasure. But you stay, Vadim. Absolutely. <laughs>